I've heard this morning, and for me the one thing which really stands out is this passion coming from to the presenters. And that passion that we have, I think, if you don't have that, then whatever else, we're always <coughs> on one way side somewhere. And I would like to remind you all of passion as something which is not always there, and how important it is to understand this as a school teacher. Because it does not matter what your profession may be, whether you're a game ranger, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, and particularly if you're a school teacher, those are all of them. Your work will start off as your passion, it will become a duty, and it will eventually become a burden. And I think that this is very, very important for you to be aware of in yourselves. You give yourself, when you are again, self-analysis. When I work for my passion, I was on my duty. Monday, Monday before Monday, Monday before Friday, eventually, my degree comes to work and you start looking around for it. And it's because of functions like these, these, these workshops, where we hope that this new information which feeds the passion, which really reminds you of that, of that calling, which I would like to think is, is so critical to any successful career. A sense of a calling that this is what I was born to do. And you can bring that into that your your particular intellect or your knowledge. I heard this morning that there are some metric boys who wake up when they are in August. I woke up in late September of my metric year. And that was thanks to a man called Mike Wheeler who actually said to me, he said to me, I refuse to allow you to fail mathematics. And he took me through a series of, of le extra lessons, where within two or three lessons, I began an early and for the first time I ever failed in mathematics. This is my trick here, then September. I managed to pass that, so I got an E. I also want you to know that my matric mark was an E. I got into Basel because I got I got the D for information, but an F for geography. And that was my favorite subject. I don't know how. But I didn't have the courage to ask for the D mark. The point I want to make is that my my scholastic career that rather should I say, incredibly unspectacular scholastic career that had very, very little to do with the school teachers. Which had so much to do with me. Not that I was necessarily attention deficit, but I was definitely a dreamer. I'm almost certain that there might well have been little tinges of depression in a boy with long standing homesickness, miles and miles away from home in the Zambia. But be it as it may, what happened with respect to my love affair with one of my boys in high school blossomed after I did school, not while I was at this And I want to put this into perspective for you because I've heard this morning about the various approaches which we have towards educating boys. There's, there's always the time factor. You never ever know when the boy will catch on. When the boy says, aha, now I know what the school is about. Now I know what that particular teacher was trying to tell me. And as I said, that can come after you long after you've left students. Because remember, the issues around adolescence are very, very universal. They are about identity, they are about relationships, and they are about career. And today, as you know, um, adolescence it has nothing to do with being a teenager. They can prolong some way into the 40s. What am I going to do? Who am I? What about my relationships? So there's an ongoing process. And then one remembers his great mentors, the teachers, the particular qualities which made us say, now I see it. So the, the, the concept of the late developer is very, very real. I could not have left the school one second later. Not because I hated it, but because I felt there's some, got to be something else here. And when I went to university on this ridiculous grade, which I would never ever have gotten to ask to tell you by today's standards, I thought, wow, so this is it. 
and now is an avenue for me to pursue. Now, things are difficult, things are changing, and I think one of the biggest factors we have to look at today, and we can have relevance to this presentation, the hero's journey, is that there's been a significant role reversal in, a, in the old concept of apprenticeship. When I was a boy, in the times that I did see my father, which was twice a year, I for seven years, he taught me how to change soft plants when I'm on a motor car. Today, you wouldn't dream of touching a motor car, fiddling around with computerized vehicles. But even more importantly, is that with the technological advancements, as a father, I am absolutely technologically illiterate that I needed my children to teach me. It's a complete reverse. When a child starts having to teach the parents, the point is, what is, how are we going to deal with this? Right? Because sometimes, as, a, as Gavin was saying, you know, your child treats you like a dork. <laughs> Dad is stupid. And yet, somewhere in that is the, is the opportunity for an immensely important relationship um, with younger people, that is to allow yourself to be taught by younger generations. Because what is also leading to is the whole concept of what I would like to call intergenerational leadership. That the days of top-down leadership are, are very, very limited. When I say limited, they are limited to very, very specific situations, which, by the way, could well be described more as a militaristic approach. This intergenerational leadership, where we listen to the voice of the younger people, in spite of their levels of emotional maturity. Okay? And it is that I think is important. I'll just give you one example. We have, um, I, I'm, my work these days is very, very much geared towards a greater understanding of, of the natural environment and how this links to human identity. But who we are as individuals, as, as, uh, as yeah, who we are as individuals is impossible outside of relationships. Right? So it's really um, a matter of seeing that the, the, this relationship with young people uh, of, of, of asking questions in regards to the future. Where is this country going to be in the year 2030 or 2040? But it might be a damn good idea to have somebody on that sitting committee who's going to be alive in 20 you know, to give the feedback. Right, that is my introduction. Uh, this is my passion. And I would like to say that for me, every time I come back to this school, I don't think it's a, I could ever not mention the name of Tinky Haynes and um, Tinky Diaga. You know that Gavin spoke about Clyde Roster and Simon Perkins. Well, these are two milestone people in my life. And <coughs> Tinky Hanks, for me, encapsulated what I think is the most crucial quality gaining successful teacher who ever had respective relationships with, them, with, with the other. The kind man. If you cannot be kind, you're not going to make it. And kids know that, they can see. This kindness here, and that doesn't, as you know yourself, it's got nothing to do with, with um, being infirm. It's not being kind, it's something generally consistent about these particular people. And then there was this man, Tiki Diaga, who believed in me. And damn, we need those people. You need those people in your life. Because what I'm going I'm to show you today is that, you know, as parents, parents can't be mentors. Care, parents or caregivers. Make sure you're dressed for school. They give you the basics, the food, the nourishment. They pay the school fees. They run you to school and back again. Your parents can be mentors at the same time. It takes those odd fellows, funny guys. The ones who are just a little bit different from your mum and dad to introduce you to a world which your parents could never ever teach you. And so, the hero's journey. And I would like to think, I would like to think that this poem which I'm going to recite to you and which you are going to analyze before you leave today will um, be a story which deep down you'll be able to say, this story has something to do with me. This boy, this boy that I'm going to be speaking about has something to do with me. This is a poem which is written by a man called David Wagoner. We spent many years up in Northwest Canada amongst the uh, American Indian people there and got to understand their way of relating to the environment. 
and how the, the environment, the landscape, the creatures within that landscape, all fit into not only a sense of personal identity, but a sense of continuity and interdependence, human beings to the land, to the animals, something which I think is hugely precious. And he wrote this poem called Salmon Boy. For the salmon, the fish, in that particular part of the world is crucial to the diet of the people. Right? And during those long, long winter months, you rely there on the availability of the dried salmon. Okay, so you can catch the fish stuff with the sun in the spring. Come winter, there's a dry fish to get you alive in terms of your basic dietary requirements. Salmon boy. <coughs> that boy was hungry. That boy was hungry. His mother gave him dog salmon. Only the head. It was not enough. He took it to the banks of the river, hungry. He lay down, salt water filled in his eyes, he turned over. Now, he was beneath the water. Now, he was beneath the water. His wide eyes opened, he could not close them. He saw stones shimmering beneath him. He was breathing the river through his mouth. Now, he was salmon boy, and he saw the salmon people waiting, and they said, this water is our wind. We are tired of swimming against the wind. Come to the deep, calm valleys of the sea. We too are hungry. We must meet the herring people, and so, turned the blue green tails and the salmon boy followed. He saw a woman who was half stone. He heard the long high howl of wolf whale, heard seal mother whistling, <coughs> heard the sound of the laughter of sea snake. He saw loon mother flying through branches of seaweed he felt changes turn over and over deep down in his sleep. And he followed. He followed to the edge of the sky, to where the sky opens and shuts, and to where the moon opens and closes forever. And the hairy people that came, bringing feasts of stars, and salmon boy through amongst those stars, crying, hungry, hungry, that is how he felt. But, but, <coughs> posts of heaven shook, and the rain fell like pieces of wood. Posts of heaven shook, and the rain fell like pieces of wood, and the salmon returned, breathing once more the sweet, saltless taste of the river beneath them, and the salmon boy followed. Salmon boy swam fastest of all. He leapt from the water, slapping his blue, green, silver tail, crying, hey ho, hey ho, I jump again and again. I am salmon boy. I can breathe everything. I can see everything. I can swim everything, and then his father speared him. He said nothing as he lay on that bank as his father emptied his belly. He said nothing when his mother opened him up wide to dry in the sun. Ah, he was filled with the sun. All day he lay on the sticks staring upstream sound. How's that for a bird? How's that mm -hmm. for a message which tells the story of a young boy's life, of any human being's life, a quest for the journey to go out and discover the world for yourself. So let's have a look at it. That boy has something to do with you and me. This poem has something to do 
with you and me. And thank heaven for the poetic language. So as I was saying to Trace, the poetry will watch it from behind you. You can do a normal didactic teaching. The poetry just finds its way between yes and no. Creeps and surprises you again and again. That boy was hungry. What do we, what do we mean? We all know that. Hungry for what? Adventure. Hungry for adventure. Good. Speak up if you have it. Independence. Yeah. Independence. Yes. Hungry for yeah. It's adventure. It's independence. It's knowledge. Identity. I, there you go. <laughs> Hungry for an identity. Who am I? I cannot stay in this particular home. And by the way, you, you'll get to you see here, his mother gave him dog salmon. So the boy's hungry, his mother gave him dog salmon, not his father. His father comes in a little bit later, and mom comes back with some pictures, you really see. But the mother gives him dog salmon. And that mother is not only the biological mother, by the way. For me, one of my boys in high school was a mother that gave him dog salmon. It just wasn't enough. And I got I owe the school uh, a vote of thanks for sending me on my journey. I need to get out of here. Right. Stop water to fill my eyes when towards the end of my days here. You know, salt waters are, uh, you know what they are. They, they, they go on the tears, and obviously they are the link between the, the, the human physiology with the ocean, the salt of the sea, and everything that goes with that. But his mother. They were dark salmon, but it, it was not enough. Now that is a critical word, enough. What is the meaning or the definition of enough? Because not only is it a source of longing, a potential source of longing in a young boy taking off, it is the source of an enormous <coughs> amount of anxiety in parents. Enough what? Enough love? Enough attention? Enough approval? Was I good enough? You'll hear parents say this, won't you? Well, I'll tell you my work in psychiatry, and particularly in the, the counselling, is to try and help parents who have problems with children. Try and help parents to come to terms with the fact that they were good enough. There's just sometimes nothing you can do with this particular child at this particular time. You've got everything possible. Because that, that boy's future, that boy's um, I don't want to use the word salvation, but it's that boy's healing. Not going to come from inside the home. You're not going to forget this. It's going to come from the salmon people. It's going to come from the herring people, whoever they are. It's going to come from the journey. And as parents, we have to be able to let the child go. As Buddha written here, in childhood, the, 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 the child is a headache and then it becomes a heartache. I think, as you all know, it's just pretty damn well we don't know everything about children get up to. You've got to trust that somewhere along the line, that it's going to work out for most of them, and trust in, the, in um, their obsessive search for some young boys have to find themselves. So, he carries us to the mouth of the river, so he goes to a source of flow. Salt water fills his eyes, he turns over and over, he turns into now. He is swimming beneath the water, his wide eyes open. We know those days of our lives, don't we? But suddenly you see the world just a little differently. You arrive in a new venue, you arrive in a new school, you've gone from one boarding house, you've graduated into another, and oh, and the point is, why should it be what I like? Well, because you're, you're in, now you're beginning to meet some of the people who are very, very different to your parents, and sometimes very, very different, who have different value systems to you. Very, very different belief systems. Now you're rubbing shoulders against, against um, the potential candidates of the school of hard knocks. Welcome it. And as our Rocky says there, be prepared to take, take the blood. You've got to take the blood without pointing fingers, but that takes a certain emotional maturity. The fact of the matter is he is by 
into the journey. So, A, the necessity, the importance of leaving home. Right? And that home is not just the physical home, it is the psychological home. But never ever underestimate the importance of them, and neither do, I'm sure none of us do, of that early mother, mother and father influence on the young boy. Um, you, for those of us who have worked in it, and I'm sure they're here, you, you often come to terms with the vulnerability of your own parents, <coughs> of the genuineness of your own parents as an older person. Now, what is interesting in this, this video we saw about Rocky, when he speaking, he's speaking to his son, I presume. Yeah. 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 What do you think? It was important about that regarding what I've just said about a parent cannot be a mentor. And a caregiver, they cannot be a mentor. Yeah, of course they can be a mentor. Because yeah, he's a mentor. He's divorced. This is not mom and dad looking not the boys and making sure all the basic needs are, are met. These are not the parents who give unconditional love to their, their child and, and say to them things like, Whatever you do, I will support you. Mm -hmm. Go for it and I will back you. Yes, and I love you over the telephone. True mentors. Don't just say whatever you do. Very often I'm a mentor by yourself. I said, you do that. This is what you do that. That was a father who was distant from, from the son in a marital situation and then has an opportunity to become a mentor. He says to him, you must do the most important thing He says to you the most important thing in my life. Wow! The father, I don't like your father who turned on and said that to his son in a, in a mental situation. I don't know. You're going to do it to be argued. By the way, I'm sorry that I feel like um, Gavin is not here when he spoke about only, only men who can teach boys how to care. I don't agree with that, man. Um, I'll tell you what. Let, let, let's soften that a bit. I think women are very important in helping boys to care. A woman can teach a man how to care. Sometimes like nobody else. And I know for a fact that when I, I think of some of the, the, my mentors in medicine and psychiatry, these were women there. They taught me how to listen, <coughs> taught me how to care, like no man. So mm -mm, these are just um, statements which I think we have to, to be uh, to look at. So he's the sound of people are waiting. This water is our wind. He goes with the flow. The question is, who are the seven people? The seven people are waiting for him. Now you'll see here, at any one time we're dealing with a paradise here. The one is the external journey to the sea and back. The other is the internal journey. With the seven people on one hand are his peers. These are colleagues. Okay? These are com traveling companions who are also hungry. And they speak about fantastic people. And when I say fantastic, I mean the, 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 the fantasies by which the imagination are stirred. Wait till you get to the United Kingdom or Europe or the United States of America, wherever you're going to go travel, like Africa or whatever it is. Wait till you get there, then you'll meet the real people. You need those individuals in our, in our, in our imagination. But of course, there are seven people who could also be the inner voices. Could also be the inner voices, and I would like to reserve that inner journey to the second part of the journey to the sea here. This, in psychological terms, the journey down to the sea is the extroverted journey. You're looking for action. You want to go out there and you want to smell all the perfume, as some of the poets speak. And we must find the hearing people. And so he followed, which is quite interesting. He spent the time following. And then, boy oh boy, does he meet a few oddballs along the way. Yeah? He saw Shell walking backwards. Are you supposed to walk that way? No, this Shell walked backwards. We know there's individuals in our lives. Yeah? We know that very often in, in extended families, the so-called black sheep of the family. We don't want to talk about it to him. Because he, he was alcoholic, we had one year in jail, or you know, he's over there. Sometimes I'm preparing to be the drink one. It gives you the spark. Yeah. 
very fascinating part of history. We all know more or less those kind of individuals in our lives. Women who is half stone, very unlike his mother. Heard the long high howl of a wolf like God. Once again, in a corner, all the outer, the whistling of sneezes. Think about that. Being out there on a journey, and you hear someone's laughter that is directed towards you. And you know what for me is critical about, about that? Is learning to, to understand the difference between taking yourself seriously and taking your work seriously. As a poet, a number of poetry. Don't miss with my work. If you mess with me, take me on any time you like. You can pull me to pieces. You go, hey, have a go. I'm a little bit happy to have a, have a giggle, but don't mess with my work. Now, how about that as a school teacher? <clears throat> I, my work is to teach, to try and bring out the best in you. Don't miss with that. That is a boundary. Yeah. You mess with me. We'll have a little joke afterwards, and as I'll come and put up one of those slides, Gavin Fish, the humor, the assertion that comes with the humor. Yeah. Don't mess with my work. And he feels the changes over and over. So here we've got all manner of changes. We've been introduced to concepts of neurobiology today, which I find funny. By the way, um, this, I'm, I'm fairly steeped in this kind of work now. And it is important, but it isn't everything. Yeah. <laughs> Not everything. We have all these incredible neurological foci in the brain, these nuclei, these activity singular. This lights up there, that lights up there. And one thing, the one thing, which is utterly unique to every individual, is that every one of those neurological nuclei are wired differently. Different wiring. Wiring is critical. You take an young child when it's born, right? Any wire compared to what you end up with. And depending on your relationships, and I'm going to skip, I'm going to say this, depending on your relationships with others, with the environment, that is how the wiring takes place, and that's what, what they call neuroplasticity has to do, has to do with. And if there's a problem somewhere, the wiring moves to the other areas. So the brain, brilliant, beautiful, wonderful to to decipher where um, the different um, geographical regions within the skull that we can test pain and where we can test happiness and what have you. That'd be very careful. Now reducing everything just to those particular nuclei because it doesn't work that way. And so the heron people bring in the feasts of eggs that he develops. And he is exposed to all manner of experience. And then the posts of the heron shook and the rain fell like pieces of moon. What is that? That is an absolute guarantee that your soul will be trodden on in your life. In the post of heaven shed, that could be a divorce, that could be being fired from your job, that could be a, a significant betrayal late in your life, that could be a, a marginalization or rejection, you're going to have your soul trodden. And the big question is, how the hell do you, you do to pull yourself out of this one? And here's something which is quite important. There are three things, I think, which any individual would have all. And that is the thought of being betrayed, the thought of being rejected, and the thought of being marginalized. All right? It's so those three. I will guarantee you. Every single one of you in this room has been betrayed. That you have been rejected. That you have been marginalized. Guarantee it. In smaller or greater ways, it doesn't matter. They are there. But what is interesting is that that betrayal and rejection and marginalization could also be something you do to yourself. You could betray a dream. You could betray the journey. You could reject it. You can marginalize it, I'll put this off to some other time. Yeah, you, that dream. I'll deal with you later, and that later. And that it will come. And here's something else before we, we end up wallowing in our soft despair. <laughs> Every one of you 
every one of us, has betrayed. We have rejected. We have marginalized. What am I saying? This is archetypal behavior. It is critical for human growth to know how to deal with these situations in our lives. We've got to be able to take those blows at the same time as earning up our own contribution towards our own suffering. So we can actually be able to do it. Rocky says that. And that the point in the thing is that it starts always with us. And so, there's a massive turnaround in the life of Simon Boy. And the rain fell like pieces of wood. And the question is, who picks up the pieces? Who would have to do that? You can only pick up somebody and you know it out people. And because of the way that you found yourself rocking the posts. If other people to pick up the pieces. But the point is now it's an internal journey. And in some of the people breathe once more the sweet salt can stay still the sweet. Breathing once more the rivers through their mouth. And the salmon boy follows. So now he's had a few knocks. And he's cut with a hoop. He's paid his dues. He can stand up and he can give a lecture to his organization. He's without any doubt. Um, Done pretty well. Why? Because here, Simon Boy swam fastest of all before he was following. Now he's moved right through. He has now, he's swimming fastest of all. I can see everything, I can breathe everything, I can swim everything. And then what? Well, shit happens there. <laughs> and then his father speared him. He said nothing as he lay on the bank, as his father emptied his belly. Mum comes back into the picture. He said nothing as his mother opened him up wide to dry in the sun. Ah, he was filled with the sun. All day, he lay on sticks, staring up the stream. Well, <coughs> this is ultimately the great homecoming. It is the great homecoming towards an assessment of a life that has been a combination of the upward journey and the inward journey. It's been a life that has been filled with measurement and it's a life that's equally filled with metaphor, of representations of understanding the world more and more as a mirror of who you are. It is a massive journey of coming to terms with the importance of relationships. And he goes back to his people. It is about moving back into a greater sense of community. It is about understanding, as I've just hinted, that in the spirit and opening up to the sun is at last a greater understanding of your and my individuality that has been absolutely impossible outside of relationships. And for some, it is a greater sense what could be described as the pattern of God in the vision. Overall, there is a salmon boy staring upstream, up towards the source, the great source from which all of us come, back into the universe itself. And so, I want to say thank you for allowing me just to, to share this little poetic insight into the journey of the boy, the hero's journey, the fact that it's difficult for parents to be mentors. The mentors are found amongst the seven people, amongst the odd people, the woman that's half a stone, you know, the moon mother who flies through the branches of seaweed, <coughs> the laughter of seal snake. And the skies are around very important to us, and they every people. What an opportunity to review our own lives, I think, and be thankful for really, really important so much. And that is the beauty of poetry, as I say. It's a language which I think should be encouraged over and over again. Why? Because it asks exactly the same questions as empirical science. What's your thought? That is a scientific question. What is it all about? Let's prove it. The poet says, What's it all about? Let's go out and disprove it. So, thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you for an unusual evening to a, a long group of
sessions, I think it's kind of uplifted the soul a little bit to be being introspective and being thinking about the things, and I think this is just a fantastic way to end the end of the time. So thank you for your insights and what you have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, I'm going to fill you with spirit. Wonderful. That's the privilege. Thank you. 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 Th